Praise the Lord, everybody. Glad to see you tonight. Welcome to our Wednesday night uh, session. We'll be reading from Acts chapter 20. Uh, and where in the past we've had some rather lengthy sections, today I'm going to have mercy on us all. And I'm only going to read one verse. We'll be reading verse 35. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. This is Paul, of course, speaking to the elders of the church of Ephesus. And he says, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Praise the Lord. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your love and your mercy to us. We ask that you would please touch us tonight and anoint us uh, to hear your word and to have it do its its proper uh, role in our lives that we might be made more pleasing to you we thank you for it in jesus name amen. amen thank you please be seated in our last message we looked at paul's farewell to the elders of the church in ephesus by taking it in three sections uh, the we looked at the church the threat and the solution and we talked about the words uh, Presbyteros and Episcopus, and the fact that it is the Holy Ghost who anoints individuals to be guardians of the flock. And we looked at Paul's example of how to be an overseer of part of the Lord's flock of saints. And we looked at the threats that Paul identified, you know, facing the church, both from the outside and from within. Um, and we identified, uh, or we looked at the ways Paul gave us and to protect ourselves from those threats and we concluded uh, the lesson with the solution to the threats and to the well-being of the church and that solution of course is the Lord Jesus Christ and we are to trust in him and to hold on to his word and we concluded with looking at the fact that Paul wrote that God purchased the church with his own blood the fact that the Lord or that the one true, only wise, and only living God became the man Jesus Christ and shed his very own blood, the only blood that is God's, to make us his own. Uh, so that was last week, and tonight uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about Paul's example to us. In this verse that we read tonight, Paul states that he has shown the uh, presbyteros of the, that sounds really insulting, um, mm -hmm. I don't recommend you call somebody that. Uh, it, it's it's the word translated here as elders, and from which we get the word presbyter. And actually, I think we get presbyter from the Latin form of the Greek word. I forget how all that works. English is a very welcoming language. We'll use any sound from anywhere to make, uh, if if we think it helps. Uh, so in the verse that we read, Paul states that he has shown the elders all things, demonstrating how we needed to work to support the weak and uh and remember the words of the lord jesus christ that it is more blessed to give than to receive there's two two things right up front paul is not saying that he has shown the elders everything that there is that's not what he means by saying uh all things how so that how that labor so laboring uh, what he's saying is that in every aspect of his example in every aspect of his ministry and in every aspect of his life he has demonstrated that it is more blessed to give than to receive. He's saying, in all of these things, in everything that I've done, I've demonstrated this. And, this, and the second thing here is that he's, he's very clear when he says this, isn't he? Uh, the words of the Lord Jesus. Uh, he's very clear that he's quoting the Lord Jesus Christ when he says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Um, and it, it's odd that this is a quote of the Lord's when we don't find that quote anywhere in scripture. Well, it would seem to be odd, but we do know that the Lord demonstrated and taught this principle in every aspect of his ministry and every aspect of his life here on earth. Giving is a component of love, you know, providing for the object of that commitment and ensuring that the object of the love commitment has whatever is necessary for its well-being. Now, we could look at this in depth, but honestly, anyone who would argue that the Lord didn't demonstrate this throughout his life is just looking for an argument. 
so we'll keep moving. It's interesting, though, that Paul would know a quote from the Lord that isn't reflected in the gospel. Uh, I will remind you that Paul saw the Lord Jesus Christ in person on the road to Damascus. God appeared to him in, in person and made Paul a witness, uh, just like the disciples were to him. Uh, he only, only he did so after the fact. And Paul says this in uh 1 Corinthians 5, uh, 15, verse 8, he says, And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. And he wasn't speaking figuratively. He, he's speaking literally. Uh, he saw the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord Jesus Christ revealed himself to Paul in person, just as the disciples had known the Lord. And he had shown him events that Paul had not been around to witness, uh, such as the Lord's Supper. And we've talked about that uh, as well. But this puts Paul in a, a unique position. The Lord had opened the disciples' understanding of the scripture, right? We, we saw that. And we see how uh, after events, the they would see the scripture and it would make sense to them what had just happened, right? It was, it was, all, it was always after the, uh, if, uh, after the event, after the, the happening that, that they would suddenly be like, oh, that's why the scripture said such and such. And, uh, but, but Paul here, had kind of a guided tour through these events with the Lord himself providing the understanding. So it, he he got his understanding a little differently than them. And it's kind of interesting to witness that difference in in how he speaks versus how the some of the other apostles do. Anyway, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, this is a great topic for this time of year with people having gone uh, from a day where we proclaim thankfulness into a day of fighting for sale items uh, and then on into the gloom of the you know cold and eternal darkness, which is New England winter, and the rising cost of anything and everything and the stress of figuring out what to give everyone you're obligated to get presents for. Um, and you do all this all the, all the while knowing that the chance of you getting something that they want and will use is very unlikely. So it's a very good topic uh, for us to bring up right now. It is more blessed to give than to receive. The word blessed, you know, it's it's the first thing a Pentecostal preacher does when he, he grabs the verses, he goes and he starts looking through the Amplified for a way to twist it to, to make it into something more interesting. But uh, I think well, I don't know who it said, who said it, but I heard it from, you know, from my father. There's nothing more dangerous than a Pentecostal preacher with an Amplified Bible and a Strong's Concordance. Uh, but uh, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And the word blessed is very straightforward, right? It's widely used and it just means happy. Uh, of, of course, the, the use of the word brings to mind all the Beatitudes, right? Which is not, you know, the Beatles uh, albums. Uh, it, it's where the Lord is in it. anyway. Um, it brings to mind Psalms 1 1, right? Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so but are like the shaft, which the wind driveth away. Yeah, that's a whole lot past the, the talk about uh, blessing, but it's very tempting to talk more about this since we recently spoke about abiding in the vine and the fruit that one who is in the true vine will bring forth. But I'm going to be focused and disciplined tonight, maybe. Uh, blessed. It's just a simple translation or definition is happy. And, and happy, of course, on its own is a large topic. Mike Rowe uh, said, uh, happiness is a terrific symptom, but a terrible goal. And one thing that Americans have proven over and over again is that happiness does not come from material comfort or from gain. And, and that is one of the reasons that the holiday seasons is so hard on people's psyches. It's the it's the most wonderful time of the year, but we just lost an hour of daylight and it's dark when you wake up and it's dark when you get out of work. And, and when the sun does shine, it's, it's less shining and more barely visible, right? Uh, 
it's the most wonderful time of the year, but it's the time of the year where we feel obligated to have emotions we don't actually have, to feel happy, warm, and cheered. And uh, But our jobs don't become less stressful. Our bills don't start paying themselves. Our, our health doesn't magically improve. Our social circle does not suddenly dramatically improve. We remain the same people we are year round and sadly so does everyone else you know we, we get mad at the little brat who just opened a thousand expensive presents and then asks where's the next one you know and, and of course it's not because the kid is a brat it's because that kid has been taught that the excitement of receiving is to be celebrated over you know over and above gratitude for what it is that they have actually received uh, focused and dis this is what it looks like when i'm focused and disciplined in, in my message God help us all. It is more blessed to give than to receive. The, the Lord Jesus Christ gave his own life that we might have abundant and everlasting life. He gave of himself in, in all the miracles he performed when he was here in the flesh. And he gives of himself today when he works in our hearts and minds. And he freely gives his spirit to all who are willing to receive it. Love is not just an emotion, but it involves emotion. And one of those emotions is, is joy that we receive in providing joy for another. The Lord Jesus Christ en endured the cross, despising the shame, right? He, he bore the shame uh, in, you know, for the joy that was set before him. And I submit for your consideration that uh, the joy that was set before him was not his joy but it was our joy he did that for the joy that we would experience when we enter into his reward uh, a reward that is only available to us uh, that we can only experience it's, it's made possible only by that very sacrifice that he made so he endured all these things for the joy that we would receive as a result of his sacrifice and paul mirrors this in second corinthians 2 uh, verse 3, when he wrote that my joy is the joy of you all. It is their joy that causes him joy. And he, he mirrors uh, Christ's joy in our rejoicing. So it's better to give than to receive. Um, that does have a thread tying it together, I, I assure you. You may have to listen to it eight or nine times to find it, but it's there. Uh, Paul tells us in our verse tonight, that in everything he did, he demonstrated this truth, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so let's let's look, I say quickly, but we all know what that means, at his example. Uh, Renee's setting her timer. Paul mm -hmm. says in verse 20, I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Paul declared unto them the gospel of Christ and made sure that they were fed first the spiritual milk and then as they matured the spiritual milk in fact it is interesting and i encourage you to do so after i stop talking to go look at hebrews chapter 5 verse 12 through chapter 6 verse you know 3 to see what paul considered milk uh, it, it's a lot more substantial than what we might consider here but my, my point here though is that paul made sure that this flock was fed the word of god and he taught them everything he had which could be profitable for them, everything he had which could benefit them. He says in verse 27 that he had not shunned to declare unto them all the counsel of God. Everything that God gave him to say, he said. He was not deterred by the Jews who laid in wait for him. He was not deterred from the trials and, and dangers that beset him. Everything that God gave him to give, he gave. He gave his tears, uh, his emotions, and his energy to their well-being and protection. He says in verse 31 that for three years he did not stop warning them day and night with tears, right? And, and that just goes to show that Paul did not just teach them. Paul did not just uh, walk around as, as a minister, but he invested himself emotionally in this church as well. He gave himself wholeheartedly and uh, whole-mindedly, that's now a word, uh, to the saints of God. It is not sufficient to just give in action, right? Um, 
the scripture tells us that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And, and that means more than being happy when you give. It means that you are investing your emotions in that giving as well. You know, we don't just give money to missions, whether overseas or here in North America, to support the missionaries. We don't just give the money to support them, right? We we give them, we give that money, but we also bring our prayers and our emotional investment into it. We, you know, we give it, we we give to support them, uh, eager to help them reach their, you know, their assignments, reach the mission field, and to start fulfilling God's call in their life. We know they're sent with a purpose, and we're eager to see uh, that harvest being reaped. We're eager to see reports of souls coming to the Lord through their ministry. Uh, we rejoice with, like my brother, uh, Reverend Donald Cash, when he tells us of Bible studies given, of contacts made, and souls baptized in the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We, we rejoice when we get those reports because we don't just give money. We give of our hearts and our emotions and, and our minds with it. And Paul gave his whole heart and his whole energy uh, to to his calling and to this church. And and what he likely considered the least of his gifts, he mentions last, his labors or his day job, which covered his necessities and the needs of his company. The physical gifts, the financial support, these things that are can be hugely important. But even more important is our giving of ourselves, of our hearts, our thoughts, our prayers, so that God can guide us to meet their needs in the most meaningful ways possible. Paul tells us of his wholehearted commitment and efforts for the saints of God uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We can start reading at 23. He says, uh, in labors more abundant, you know, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. I am more of a minister in Christ, right? Uh, a servant of Christ. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft of the Jews. Five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. And journeyings often, and perils of water, and perils of robbers, and perils by mine own countrymen, and perils by the heathen, and perils by the cities, and perils by the wilderness, and perils by the sea, or in the sea, and perils among false brethren, and weariness, and painfulness, and watchings often, and hunger, and thirst, and fastings often, and cold, and nakedness. That's a pretty long and extensive list, and none of us want that. Uh, besides those things which that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches he suffered a great deal but it never stopped him he lists all these dangers difficulties and, and sufferings and he saves the heaviest burden for last that besides all these external things this daily servanthood of christ uh, brings this burden of the care of all the churches it is the service that taking care of all the churches that pressed him the most uh, that was the most taxing and yet he mentions it, but he doesn't complain about it. He doesn't begrudge it. Let, let's look at a few verses uh, where Paul shows his heart, his, his love for the churches. We'll see that it's not just an affection for others, but that he has poured himself out for them, that he has invested all of himself to their care. We look at 2 Corinthians 7.3. He writes, I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and to live with you. In Philippians 2, 17, Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all, for the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. Who wants to be offered upon a sacrifice and service of someone else's faith? Eh, not me. But Paul says, I do this and I joy and I rejoice with you all uh, because, because you're rejoicing, and so I can rejoice with you. And Colossians 1.24, in fact, if we take like the last seven, uh, seven words of verse 23, he's talking, uh, I, where of Paul, I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh, for his body's sake, which is the church. He's rejoicing in his suffering. He's, he's filling himself up with, with all of the afflictions of Christ for the benefit of the church. 
and he's rejoicing in it. Why? Because he has invested himself fully in the well-being of the church. He sees the reward that God has desired, and he wants them to receive it, and he wants the Lord to re reap uh, the reward of his sacrifice, and he's invested himself within this. And we look at 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verse 8. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also of our own souls, because you were dear to us. What is this? He's, uh, he's willing to give not just the gospel of God, but he's willing to pour out his own soul in addition, because they are dear to him. And, and notice he's talking to a whole bunch of different uh, churches here, right? It's not just his favorite in Ephesus. Sorry, there's a, a gnat flying by, and I forgot that I was on camera. Um, but he's talking to a whole bunch of other uh, churches here as well, right? And he, he talks to uh, Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, verse 10. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Why is he enduring these suffer the, these things? For those who come to the Lord's sake, so that so that those uh, who are willing will obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus. Uh, he writes to in Hebrews 13, verse 17, Obey them which have the rule over you, or that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. It's possible to suffer all things with joy, knowing the benefit you're bringing someone else. And Paul, the Lord demonstrates this. The Lord lives that out. And Paul also uh, demonstrates this in his ministry. We looked at his litany of sufferings in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and we see the burden of caring for the churches. We see these verses showing his love for them and his emotional investment as well as his investment of his time, energy, and money. He further demonstrates this spirit of giving in the following chapter in, in 2 Corinthians 12, 15. Well, let's in, we'll include verse 14 as well because it speaks to that mindset. 2 Corinthians 12, 14 and 15, he writes, Behold, a third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you. For I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. I will gladly spend. It's the cheerful giver that will change the world. The begrudging gift bears only bad fruit. The motive determines the fruit. Remember that. Um, we're taught that repeatedly. I will glad, not just gladly, but I will very gladly spend and be spent. See, Paul is not just spending his money, uh, but he's he's speaking of being spent, uh, spending his own self, his energies, his effort, and even his life. And he assures the church in Corinth that I will very gladly give all that I have and give all that I am for your benefit. And I do so knowing that it will only cause you to love me less. You know, sometimes, uh, Sometimes real love is, is not always comfortable and cheery, right? Sometimes real love is telling somebody a hard truth uh, and awakening them in their awareness to the dangers they face. But this is the example that Paul gives us because we can look at the immense effect that Paul has had throughout the centuries in Christ's service. He very gladly gave his all in service to the Lord. And 2,000 years later, we continue to reap the benefit. And regardless of his, his role in establishing the church, which would endure throughout the millennia, who among us has not received a, rhema, a word from the Lord through Paul's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost? If you haven't rejoiced in awe over his majestic descriptions of the glory to come and the Almighty God and the grace which God has supplied us, then you haven't read any of his, you haven't, you certainly haven't read Ephesians, right? And he says, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And this holiday season, 
it is easy to get distracted by the commotion and the forced festivity. It's easy to become grumpy at receiving another necktie or another knickknack. My barber, is a, he's a scratch golfer, and, and he and I have joked about how every year, on every occasion, he gets some golf-themed knickknack, which he just ends up throwing away. You'd think people would get him a gift card to a sports you know, sporting goods store or something, but uh, that might at least be useful. But in this season, it's, it's easy to get caught up in the stress of having to find the right gift or at least an acceptable present for everyone on your I have to buy for list. It's easy for the giving to become a form of, of dues payments for belonging to a family or a social circle. But I, I encourage you tonight to, to move beyond that. It's great to give gifts, but more than knickknacks and novelty teas, why don't you make the decision to give the people in your life a greater gift, the gift of yourself? Determined to live a life in Paul's example, edifying one another, lifting one another up, teaching uh, one another uh, the things of the Lord. My, my brother Dan has this giving spirit. I've got to be careful with what I say around him or he'll go take care of it for me. Um, I once told him we were talking and I got a little bit dizzy because it was like two o'clock on a Sunday and I hadn't eaten yet. And yes, I said so. And he turned around and left the conversation. In a couple of minutes, he came back with a, from the store with a bunch of grinders for me because you know he has that spirit of giving. And my brother, Phil and sister Sherry have swung by my house with food, gummies and Coca-Cola because they knew that Renee and the boys were away and I was busy and would probably forget to eat. My sister Lisa has run to the store uh, time after time when, when my household was too sick to do so ourselves. And my brother Steve has shown up in my house at 3 a.m. to help me sand the walls that I was getting skim coated so that they'd be ready for the workers in the morning. Oh, you know, I'm surrounded by people like that. And, and I just give a few examples out of the hundreds that I could give, but being surrounded by people who are willing to give of themselves is an immense blessing. And again, that's just, you know, a handful of, of, of the of the examples I could give. And Paul gave the churches in Ephesus all that he had to give. He worked a day job to pay the bills and support his crew. He did not keep anything back that was profitable for the church in Ephesus or the church in general. He did not hold back from declaring to them the whole purpose of God and the whole counsel of God. He didn't, uh, he didn't uh, resist or he wasn't hesitant to tell them even the hard truths that God had given them. He taught them everything he knew about the Lord, everything he had received from the Lord. Paul made sure that they were equipped to serve the Lord in his absence, and he never ceased to warn them of the dangers that they that face all believers, false doctrine and false prophets. He gave his labors, he gave his teachings, he gave his tears, and in doing so, he lived out the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Paul is a great example of finding joy in pouring himself into the mission God gave him. He epitomizes the word of the Lord, freely ye have received, freely give. And in this example, or in his example, he proves that it's not the freely receiving that completes us. Mm -hmm. We receive this gift which which makes everything, which gives us newness of life, which which brings us to greater and more wonderful spiritual heights, and we feel completed, but we are not completed in just receiving. It is in the freely giving that we are made complete. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love and your mercy to us. We thank you for the example uh, that you provide and that you've provided to us through Paul and how to give ourselves to, uh, to your church, to those around us. Lord, I ask that in this holiday season, you would touch us all, that you would, you would help us to see past the busyness and even past the celebration of, of your, uh, your birth and look into ourselves to see what we could truly give of ourselves in submission to you that would benefit those around us. Lord, give us that heart of a servant, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.